Daniel the 8th chapter, as we look at the principles of present truth, Daniel the 8th chapter, after the book of Ezekiel is the book of Daniel, chapter 8, and we're looking at verse 14. Daniel the 8th chapter and verse 14. Our topic again is present truth. Present truth. In Daniel 8 and verse 14, we see the central theme, the central text of Adventism. And I want to submit to you that this text is as little known and little understood and little preached among us today as it ever was. This text we're about to read, many people as they hear this by video or by audio or even maybe in this room, some people may have heard this text for the first time as we read it today. And this text is a text that Adventism falls or rises upon. If this text can be proven to be false or this text is not insignificant, there's no reason for Adventism. And the various truths that we have in Adventism are all a fallacy. In Daniel 8 and verse 14, the Word of God says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And we've known in our previous studies that there was a great movement based upon this text of Scripture that happened in the 1800s called the Great Advent Movement. Here in America, a preacher by the name of William Miller, as well as various ministers all over the world that had not even met each other, like Joseph Wolfe and Lacunza in South America, and various people started going all over their respective countries and areas preaching a very similar message based upon Daniel 8, 14, saying that Jesus was soon to come and the 2300 prophecy or 2300 day prophecy was coming to an end. They believed that this prophecy showed the cleansing of the sanctuary being the cleansing of the earth by fire and not Jesus doing the very work that he had stated in the book of Hebrews that he was doing. In Hebrews 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest which is set upon the right hand of the Father of the majesties in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary. In Hebrews 8, Jesus, as he ascended to heaven in A.D. 31, ascended into the heavenly sanctuary, which Hebrews 8 says is the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched not man. This cleansing of the sanctuary was not dealing with the earth or any sanctuary that had been upon the earth. It was dealing with, after 2300 literal days, God would enter into his final work in the heavenly sanctuary, which he began in A.D. 31. The people of God at that time did not understand these things, but they preached a prophetic message and had the right time and the right Savior and the right message, but they made a wrong application in how this prophecy would finish. And when we look at that, brothers and sisters, we're seeing that this text was bringing to the people of God present truth. It was bringing to them an understanding of the final prophecies that would take place at the close of the 23 day prophecy and the people that embraced these truths and saw the advancing light that God was giving because of Daniel 8.14 and his kindred text, these people would become what we know today as Seventh-day Adventists. And I want to say conversely also, those people that do not understand these things and don't understand what Daniel 8.14 means to us and the truths that it brought to view and the prophecies that all converge in this great prophecy of Daniel 8.14 are not Seventh-day Adventists. Not because God doesn't want them to be, but they can be because Revelation 14 shows the message going to all the world and calling people into the three angels' message or the message of Seventh-day Adventists. And this message is a specific message. Daniel 8, 14, as well as Revelation chapter 14, both point in the same direction, which is the most holy place. And in the book Great Controversy, the pen of inspiration gives us a clear understanding of what took place in the 1800s, how they made a, a wrong application, but also it shows that without a correct understanding of Daniel 8.14, we cannot see clearly present truth. We cannot understand what the people of God are supposed to be doing today, what you and I are supposed to be doing today. Is there a, same, a similarity between the faith of God's people today and the people of God in the time of Jesus? Yes. We're the remnant of her seed. But even further than that, there were some principles of truth that had been lost sight of that as the people came to this time period after the passing of time in 1844, there were new duties to be revealed that had not been clearly seen before. They were always a part of the truth, but it had not been clearly seen before. Uh, you have a handout today. You can give me a hand and just pass this out. Called Present Truth. As everyone gets one of these handouts, I'd like you to look at a quotation from the book Great Controversy. The book Great Controversy. We're going to find the book Great Controversy as a chapter called in the Holy of Holies. Now in that chapter, 
the Lord's prophetess, she deals with the fact that in ancient Israel, when Jesus came upon the scene, they refused to receive the message of Christ. And though they refused to receive Christ's message, when Christ ascended to heaven and the Holy Spirit was poured out, how many of the Jews received the Holy Spirit? How many? Anyone know? About 120. How many Jews were there in Jerusalem? Millions. How many received the Holy Spirit? About 120, according to Acts chapter 1. Why? Because they rejected the message and they did not know what Jesus was doing. They didn't understand the work he was doing prophetically and spiritually. And they could not by faith take hold of the blessings to be received. She says, so similarly, we have come to the end of time. And the prophecy of Daniel 8.14 is showing us where Jesus is and new power to be poured out from heaven. Not just early rain power, Pentecostal power, but even latter rain power. And so similarly, we all in this room will be like the Jews of old. They cannot receive the outpouring of God's spirit. Why? We do not know the work for this time and the ministry that Jesus is doing now. Look at your first quotation taken from Great Controversy 424. The first quotation says, both the prophecy of Daniel 8.14, quoting, under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, and the first angel's message, quote, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, pointed to Christ's ministration in the most holy place, to the investigative judgment, and not to the coming of Christ for the redemption of his people and the destruction of the wicked. This is what they believed at that time. They believed this was going to deal with the destruction of the wicked. No. It dealt with the most holy place ministry of Christ and the investigative judgment. It goes on. The mistake had not been in the reckoning or the adding of the prophetic periods, but in the event to take place at the end of the 2300 days. Through this era, the believers had suffered what? Disappointment. Oh, it's called the great disappointment. Yet all that had was foretold by the prophecy and all that they had in any scripture warrant to expect had been accomplished. Everything had been accomplished. What had been accomplished? Well, in Daniel it says very clearly, in Daniel 12, that at the time of the end, that many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased concerning the prophecies. From 1798 all the way up to 1840, one generation, this prophecy had been fulfilled. And all the kindred prophecy concerning it had been fulfilled. And Revelation 10 said that they would receive this message and it would be like honey in their mouth, but bitter in their stomach. All the prophecies said had been fulfilled, but they, dis they did not understand the event. We're continuing. It says, at the very time when they were lamenting the failure of their hopes, the event had taken place which was foretold by the prophecy or by the message and which must be fulfilled before the Lord could appear to give reward to his the Lord must come but before he comes he must enter in this last phase of his work or the most holy place work in the heavenly sanctuary above continuing but the people were not yet ready to do what in other words brothers and sisters they were looking for Jesus to come and they were preparing for Jesus to come to the light they had in 1844. But were they really prepared? No, they weren't prepared. Now in their heart and their mind, there are many people that if they died in Christ at that time, they would die saved. But they were not prepared to meet their Lord in peace because when Jesus comes, he's going to be like a devouring fire. And only those who are reflecting his character, we are told, that are, according to Revelation, holy still, and righteous still and have no wickedness in them, only they will be able to be alive and remain when that devouring fire comes from the presence of the Lord at the last trump. Only they. Were they ready at that time? There were certain principles of truth they did not understand yet, much less even the event, and they weren't prepared for Jesus' second coming. They weren't prepared for translation. They were prepared, some in their heart, because of true faith in Christ, to die in a saving relationship with Christ. However, if Christ appeared at that time, because they weren't prepared for translation, they could not receive that finishing touch of immortality. This is what Adventism teaches. There's a work of preparation to meet the Lord in peace and to give the final message. So it continues and says this. It says, but the people were not ready to meet their Lord. There was still a work of what? Preparation to be accomplished for them. Light was to be given directing their minds to the temple of God in heaven, and they should by faith follow their high priest in his... In other words, the ministry he was doing there. It says, 
new duties would be revealed. Another message of warning and instruction was to be given to the Did you see that? At the close of time in 1844, they weren't ready. And brothers and sisters, do you think that we're ready in 2011 when we don't even understand the 23 day prophecy? Let me repeat that. In 1844, there was a tremendous revival movement and they were preaching and living the truth that they had at that time. And they were studying the 23 day prophecies and many people were preaching it from memory and could quote the various parts of it and they were not ready with all that sacrifice, all that praying, all that work, baptizing hundreds and thousands of people into the faith, all the work they were doing and sacrifice they were making, all the sincerity that they have, and they did not have a preparation for Christ's second coming. And we think without any knowledge of the 23 day prayer prophecy that we're ready in 2011? The average person that takes the name Seventh-day Adventist do not understand these prophecies. But brothers and sisters, it says here that not only was this prophecy to come to its end in 1844, but there was to be more light to be given for the church. And there was to be an understanding that their minds to be drawn to the work in the heavenly sanctuary and Christ's ministry there. And there were to be new duties revealed to them. New what? Duties. New duties. The church was going to receive new duties that it had not clearly seen prior. In the 10th chapter of Revelation, we see a statement that says, Thou must prophesy again. There was to be a, a prophesying that came before, but again, there must be another prophesying. A prophesying again. A prophesying, according to Revelation chapter 10 and 11, with the added feature of God giving them a reed like unto a rod by which they can measure the sanctuary and the worshipers therein. Now, brothers and sisters, the prophesying again that the people of God were to do after receiving that bitterness in their belly was connected with the ability to measure or examine and properly make an estimate of the sanctuary, measuring the sanctuary, having an understanding of the sanctuary. And the people of God, Seventh-day Adventists, are the only people on the face of the earth, whether it be in book form or otherwise, that have a true and correct understanding of the sanctuary and the various truths that come from that. And because they have this true understanding of the sanctuary, they have the true understanding of the Old and New Testament going together, the true understanding of comparing scripture with scripture, they have the key to unlock the prophecies and see clearly what is present truth. This week I was looking on the internet and looked at the word present truth. You know how many ministries that have the name present truth? Or present truth ministries, or present truth of the kingdom, or present truth and spirit ministries? But the great proponents of people that have the name present truth don't understand what present truth is. Because present truth is based upon these prophecies and truths that have come up to be vital in these last days. Now, brothers and sisters, in the 14th chapter of Revelation, we see a message that is brought to be present truth because of the 23 day prophecy. Because when we see the end of the 23 day prophecy, we see this cleansing of the sanctuary. And we know because we understand the sanctuary truth, we have a, we have a measuring stick, uh, uh, even the scripture, even the commandments of God, by which we can measure the sanctuary and understand how we may prophesy again what this, this, this greater prophecy is for these last days. When we study the sanctuary, what was the cleansing of the sanctuary? Leviticus 16. Let's look at that. What book are we looking for? Leviticus 16. Look at Leviticus 16. Let's see what is this cleansing of the sanctuary. The Old Testament explained itself. The Bible explained itself by putting scripture with scripture. In Leviticus 16, let's see if we can see what the cleansing of the sanctuary was. Because the Bible teaches us in Leviticus 16 that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement, or the cleansing of the sanctuary, was being cleansed from sin. Did you get that? In other words, God was going to cleanse his people from sin on this day, and also he was going to examine them to see if they were standing right before him. In the book of Leviticus 16, let's see that. Leviticus 16, beginning with verse 30, it says this. The cleansing of the sanctuary, which we see in Daniel 8, 14, is nothing more than the Day of Atonement. Nothing more than this work in the sanctuary above, not the earthly sanctuary, the sanctuary where Jesus is, of this last work of cleansing his people and the sanctuary from sin, of judging them. It says in Leviticus 16 and verse 30 this. It says, for on that day, the priest shall make a what? Atonement for you to do what? to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the... This is dealing with the Day of Atonement. The cleansing of the sanctuary was a cleansing or an atonement. Let's continue to see that. Verse 33. It's a cleansing of the sanctuary as well as the people. Verse 33 says this. And he shall make an atonement for the... That's a cleansing of the sanctuary. 
And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement or cleansing for the priest and for all the people of the... Now, brothers and sisters, God is going to cleanse his people from their sins on this day of atonement. There has to be an examining of the people. And when we talk about the sanctuary in heaven, do we see in the word of God, the scripture to show that God is going to at some time in the heavenly sanctuary examine his people that he may remove sin from them and bring Jesus to his kingdom and his dominion? Look at Daniel now. We're going to Daniel 7 chapter. Daniel 7 chapter. In the book of Daniel, after the book of Ezekiel, the book of Daniel, notice what it says, takes place in the heavenly sanctuary above, even where the throne of God is that Hebrew speaks about. We're in Daniel 7 chapter. Daniel 7 and verse 9. God must cleanse his people from sin. He must do this work of atonement or making at one meant or at one both God and man. Because what separates God and man? Sin. Your sins are separated between you and your... So atonement is nothing more than removing sin that God and man can be brought at one again. The cleansing of sin does that. But how can he cleanse sin unless he examines to see the nature of his people? In Daniel 7 it says this. Notice what happens in the sanctuary where Jesus is, where the Father is, before Jesus comes, because there must be a day of atonement, there must be a cleansing of the sanctuary, but the cleansing of the sanctuary must be a record of sin, as well as the actual presence and power of sin. In Daniel 7 it says this in verse 9, Daniel 7 in verse 9 it says, I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure will, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, Thousand, thousand ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the the judgment was set, and the books were open. What books were open? Revelation 20 says the book of life is there, other books are there, and the dead are judged out of those books. Dead and living are judged out of those books. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 says every secret thing and everything that we've done has come into the judgment. And also we see in Daniel 7 this. In Daniel 7, and verse 13, we see not only is the Father, ancient of days, there upon the throne, but Hebrews said upon the right hand of the throne would be Jesus. Notice who comes into this throne room. In verse 13 it says this. This is taking place in the most holy place where God is going to examine these books and to see this judgment outward to its f f for finality when he removes sin from his people. Verse 13. I saw in the night vision, Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to where? Or came into this judgment hour, where this judgment scene came into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is, where Jesus is now going to do a work of ministry. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Brothers and sisters, we see God desires to cleanse his people from sin. Where is this cleansing or atoning work taking place? The heavenly sanctuary. Where the Father is, in connection with the Son, in this judgment hour, thousands of angels are ministering and doing a work there. And this work is a work of opening the judgment. In the 14th chapter of Revelation, the first angel's message says, Fear God and give glory to Him because... So the judgment hour of Revelation 14 is connected with the judgment scene of Daniel 7. And the Daniel 7 judgment scene is connected with Leviticus 16 and the cleansing of the sanctuary where God would do this work in the sanctuary of removing sin from his people, both upon the books, in their lives, and from the sanctuary. Brothers and sisters, do you see there's, a, there's a, a greater understanding of the light that comes when we put these scriptures together? But also, brothers and sisters, when we look at the 14th chapter of Revelation, we see that there are some new duties and clearer messages that come at the end of time. And because of these new duties and these clearer messages, you have a people called Seventh-day Adventists. In Revelation chapter 14, we see a message that says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth and the seed and the fountains of waters. The return to true worship in the first angel's message. There's a command to fear God and give glory to Him in the first angel's message. The second angel's message says Babylon is fallen. Revelation 18 says, come out of her my new duties. New duties. Clear light and new duties. The third angel's message warns against the mark of the beast, the image of the beast. It warns against the plagues of God falling or the wrath of God. And it warns against the fires of the last day, the lake of fire. 
new duties and clearer life. And this message must go to all the world and the only people that can give this message and actually show it from the word of God are Seventh-day Adventists. But what if Seventh-day Adventists were caused to put down these peculiar parts of their message? Or especially, what if ministers fail to preach Daniel 8, 14 and the history of it? The clear text that show what it means to us and what time and, and part of the history of the church we're in right now so that we could see clearly what these new duties are, what this message we must prophesy and give to the world is, and this ministry and work that we have, what if they could not see that? Would our mission be changed? Would our logo be changed? Would our church be changed? Would the way that people act and even dress and talk and walk and eat and live be changed? We'd have a new organization. We'd have a new type of Adventism. We'd have a new church. If the pioneers would wake from sleep in a special resurrection and went around and looked at, around to the various churches, they would not know where they were because of the fact that the truth that they had been given by God, by line upon line and precept upon precept, has been point by point chiseled and eaten away over generations of indolence and, and being an unwise steward of the manifold grace of God to the point now where there is a faint resemblance to the Adventism, the true Adventism of old that was in the time of Ellen White and James White and Uriah Smith and S. N. Haskell and John Loughborough. These men knew what Adventism were. And they were living in the full light of truth. They were walking the truth as it is in Jesus. They had the truths that showed them those new duties and they were following them and they had that greater light and they were preaching it. And brothers and sisters, we need to understand what that greater light is that we can preach it. Because in Revelation 14, the people that in verse 12 are called to keep the commandments of God, have the faith of Jesus. What if Satan got to get these people that are supposed to have the commandments of God to break the commandments of God? I said, what if he can get them to break the commandments of God? And what if he gets them to believe that this breaking of the commandment of God is keeping it? Because when we look at the 14th chapter of Revelation, it says that we're to worship God as the creator of heaven and earth and sea and the fountain of the water. How do we worship God as the creator? Through the Sabbath. And in Exodus chapter 20, the Sabbath commandment is the only commandment that shows who the God of the commandments are. It shows him as the creator of heaven and earth. And because he's the creator of heaven and earth, he asks for a specific type of worship, which is the keeping of the seventh day, not the first. The seventh day, not, not Wednesday. The seventh day, which is sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, keeping that 24-hour period as sanctified unto the Lord, leaving secular employment and doing spiritual labor. Laboring to enter in, allowing the word of God to be seen in you. They have to be Sabbath performed because you know what happened? In 1798, when this revival movement started, <clears throat> when this movement started all the way to 1844, and since that time, when the people of God started hearing these truths, they were not ready to see Jesus as a commandment keeper because commandment keepers, those that have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments, are ready to see Jesus in peace and to be alive and remain when he comes. But with all those people, as sincere as they were, what were they doing in 1844 when they waited for Jesus to come? They were keeping Sunday. Matter of fact, if you look at the history, you find that William Miller in 1844, the great preacher of America that was preaching all over the country these principles of the 2300 days. You know what he was doing when he was waiting for Jesus to come? He was on his porch in a rocking chair, rocking back and forth, smoking a pipe. Waiting for Jesus to come, smoking a pipe. At the time of this ignorance, God winked at. But now he's calling all men to... How's he doing it? By greater light and showing new duties that were not clearly seen before. The Sabbath is a great point of a return to true worship. And there are many people today that are among the number or the name of the people that are supposed to give this final warning and show the whole world a restoration of the true Sabbath and the keeping of it so that we'll be worshiping God and spirit and the truth. And where are they on the Sabbath? Ponderosa. Denny's. Arby's, Piccadilly Square, Golden Corral, eating on the Sabbath, buying and selling. Where are they after church? Macy's, Dillard's, Abercrombie and Fitch. What are they doing after Sabbath? Or after Sabbath, quote unquote, worship, or what we call the divine? Is just one hour divine? I thought 24 hours were holy unto the Lord. After the divine hour, Saturday morning sports, watching ultimate fighting, football, 
sports, or anything other than mission. What did Jesus do on the Sabbath? He preached, teached, and healed. What are we doing on Sabbath? Cinemax, HBO, MTV. It's as if it's just a regular day. And we're the people that give this message, but why do people have such a, 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 a faint concept of what it is? They don't understand the prophecy that made us seven day events, the truth that made us seven day events, and these, these new duties, this new light, they are unaware of. So they are actually trying to worship God like either the heathen do or those that are in the nominal churches. The first day people, they go and they keep Sunday and then they go right to all these Arby's and so on and so forth and we're right there with them. And why? Because we don't understand who we are as a people. They're, this new light and these new duties are not clear to us. But brothers and sisters, do you know that the pen inspiration, especially in the book Great Controversy, says that there's only been given 6,000 years to the reign of sin? Just like each day, Peter says, in the judgment there's 1,000 years, God has only given Satan 6,000 years. I have six days, and then the seventh day was a day of rest when I created. Okay, Satan, I'm giving you 6,000 years to do all your work, and then... There must be a thousand years of rest. After six thousand years, that millennium comes in when Jesus comes, and a thousand years Satan will be bound. This earth will rest. And when I said in her day, we have six thousand years. And this earth will rest, brothers and sisters, because God has promised it would happen. But are we prepared? Are we prepared for that time? Are we seeing a return to true worship? Because remember, if six thousand years and then a thousand years of rest, then that millennium of Revelation 20 is a Sabbath. Which means that at the end, or at sunset Friday, prophetically, when the end of the world comes, if you're not ready for the Sabbath, if you're washing and ironing clothes, if you're in the line saying, Ooh, can, I, can I get in front of you? The Sabbath is a weekly indicator of where we are. We have a daily indicator, because six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And every seventh day we have a type of the coming of the Lord and the millennium of rest. And brothers and sisters, every sixth day at sunset we see whether we, in a spiritual context, will be all preparing for the coming of the Lord. Because at 6,000 years, after the end of this world, some will be righteous and some will be righteous still. Some will be holy and holy still, but at that sunset, prophetically Friday, that prophetic sunset, some will be filthy still. Will it be you and I? You see, the Sabbath is not just a day that we choose as opposed to first day people. There's a spiritual purpose behind that. Relations 13 shows us that uh, among this idea, the mark of the beast, that the enforcement by law, especially in this country, of Sunday worship, the, the child of the papacy, as in opposition to God's true Sabbath is the mark of the beast as opposed to the seal of God where the Sabbath rests. And by choosing that or going along with that, we receive the mark of the beast when that's enforced by law. There's a greater idea to the Sabbath than just, okay, let's keep this day because God said it or because it's just something to be different from the other people. The prophecy showed us that. And the book of Daniel says that there would be a power, a little horn power that come up and he would try to change times and Laws And these times and laws, especially laws that deal with time, like the Sabbath, would lay dormant and lay destroyed until this last day people come up in Revelation 14 and restore this type of worship. Who would these people be? Baptists? Jews? Seven-day Adventists, brothers and sisters. But let's go a little farther than that. Let's go a little bit farther than that. Because not only is the Sabbath a day of worship, but what about the worship on the Sabbath? What about the worship on the Sabbath? Brothers and sisters, how did they worship in ancient Israel? As a matter of fact, let me even go a little closer than that. How did they worship on the Day of Atonement? Let's look at the book of Hebrews very quickly. Hebrews. What book are we going to now? We're going to the book of Hebrews. Because the Day of Atonement in the ancient system of the Jews is a type, is an example for the last days. Because when you look at the book of Hebrews, Paul says very clearly on the inspiration of God that what took place under the priesthood of the Levites is a shadow of things to come. A shadow of heavenly things. Isn't there a heavenly sanctuary? And heavenly work going on? It's a shadow of things to come, shadow of heavenly things. And Hebrews the 8th chapter says this. Hebrews the 8th chapter. 
Hebrews 8th chapter, notice what it says concerning Christ not having a priesthood upon earth, but entering into heaven to have a priesthood that would last to the end of time. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 4 it says this. Say amen if you have that. Amen. Hebrews 8 and verse 4 says, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, meaning Jesus, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve under the example and shadow of... So these things in the Old Testament were an example of... Heavenly things. Those, that temple in the Old Testament showed you what would happen in the heavenly sanctuary. That lamb represented Jesus. That priest represented Jesus. The knife represents all these things are type and a type. They're example, they're shadow and substance. They're shadow of things to come. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter says this. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10 and verse 1. These shadows, these symbols, the sanctuary service showed us even prophecy, things that would happen in the end of time, even in the heavenly sanctuary and even upon the earth. Hebrews 10 and verse 1 says this. Hebrews 10 and verse 1. It says, For the law having a shadow of good things to prophecy. And not the very image, the actual tangible things. It's prophetic. It's by faith in the future. Not the very image of things can never with those sacrificial offerings, which they offer year by year, continually make the comers thereunto there was a better service. It was in the heavenly that was going to do that. There was a better sacrifice. It was Christ that was going to do that. There was a judgment hour or a day of atonement that was better than the one that happened on the day of atonement in the ancient system. It was the one that would happen at the end of prophetic time, starting in 1844. This judgment hour. Are you still with me? And brothers and sisters, when the judgment hour came in, what did the people do? Leviticus 16 and Leviticus 21 talks about the day of atonement and said the people would Afflict their souls. They would fast. They would pray. They would seek God in all humility and they would afflict their souls. <clears throat> they saw the solemnity of God passing over their names, either for life or for death, and they acted in a way that was preparing them to pass this judgment. Did you hear Kirk Franklin during the Day of Atonement back in ancient Israel? Did you hear R&B and jazz? And all types of music that sound just like the club in the day of, on the Day of Atonement. You weren't supposed to hear that in the general time of the, of the, of the year. But especially on the Day of Atonement, was that, was that in harmony with the spirit of the time and the message they had to both live and give to the world? What if the heathen came into the camp to try and fall upon the graces of the, of the Hebrews to take them in and to receive them and to take away their sins by letting them go through the sanctuary service? What if they came and saw all the Israelites dancing and swaying and clapping and carrying on as if this prophetic time that by faith we know is happening in the heavenly sanctuary above was not even taking place and they were rocking and swaying just like the heathen did what would the heathen do? go right back into his camp with the same thing because you're doing the same thing that we're doing why is anything different? and brothers and sisters what if you had people that had a knowledge of all these truths and saw that in the ancient system on this day of atonement they were solemnly trying to make sure that their heart and, right was, heart and mind was in harmony with God. They were fasting. They were afflicting their soul. They were making sure that their sins were forgiven. They were making due restitution and repentance. And we were singing and swinging and celebrating. What would they say? You know what Ellen White calls the movement that we see among us that has resulted because we don't understand the message and these new duties and new light that Adventists have? Even though we take the name of Adventists, you know what she calls it? She calls it fanaticism. Fanaticism. Look at your handout. Under worship. Notice what this quotation says. Testimonies, volume 1, page 411, 412. Notice what it says. We're going to read two quotations here. Under worship. This is another aspect of return to true worship because the majority of the nominal churches have had false worship and even fanaticism. And in this last run of time, who has embraced these things that we came out of in 1844? Seven day Adventists. Testimonies, volume 1 says a spirit of fanaticism has ruled a certain class of what? A certain class of who? A spirit of fanaticism has ruled a certain class of Sabbath keepers. They are unacquainted with the spirit of the message of the third angel. That's clear. Nothing can be done for this class until their fanatical views are... But we think we can try and do something until, and work with them until, you know, while, they're, while it's getting corrected. Nothing can be done for them until these views are corrected. Fanaticism and noise have been considered special evidences of faith. In other words, uh, you know, you're too dead out there. Get up and jump. Get up and clap. Get up and sing. Raise your hands. 
Without this kind of excitement, you're not having true faith. They believe. It says, some are not satisfied with a meeting unless they have a powerful and happy time. The strong messages bringing conviction to the soul, they don't like that. They want to jump and sing and talk about how God loves them despite how they have no power to lay hold upon him. It says, unless they have a powerful and happy time, they work for this and get up an excitement of feeling, but the influence of such meetings is not what? When the happy flight of feeling is gone, they sink what? Lower than before the meeting because their happiness did not come from from God. That means depression. People go and they have these great so-called meetings and so on, and afterward they have to get all that hype and sweating carrying on. What are they? Depressed. The rates of suicide and depression in the nominal churches is astronomical. You don't believe me? Ask some of the pastors. What do you think they're doing with, the, with all the associate pastors and having psychologists in their, in their circle of pastors? Deal with all these problems that come from this bedlam of noise. You say, bedlam of noise? Look at your next quotation. Taken from Selected Messages, Book 2, page 36 and 37. Brother says, this is what has come in as a false revival to take the place of true worship, which Adventists have, returning to the Sabbath and keeping it holy, and also on the Sabbath, keeping, and all throughout the week, keeping a type of worship and even music that's in harmony with the spirit of the third angel. It says, the things which you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me would take place just before what? The close of probation. Every uncouth thing would be demonstrated. What kind of things, Ellen White? There would be shouting. Where? With drums and music. Where? And dancing. Where? Among us. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. What? Does that include the pastor? Yes. He would not be able to be trusted to make right decisions. Me, well, what about his sermons? Oh, well, I'll just go out when the music is playing. I'll go out and then I'll come back in and listen to his sermon. It said you can't even trust him to make right decisions if you're in that kind of stuff. If you're, if you're imbibing and taking in this kind, you can't be trusted to make right decisions. You said, oh, that's, you're going too far. Well, God's going too far. Is, is this English, brothers and sisters? This is not Chinese. This is English. It goes on to say this. The Holy Spirit sometimes, possibly, because we feel bad for the pastor. The Holy Spirit never revealed itself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise under the guise of Adventism. This is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious methods for making of none effect the pure, sincere, elevating, ennobling, sanctifying truth for this time. What's the sincere, elevating, ennobling truth for this time? Three in his message. So what's the purpose of this music? To cover up and make of none effect the what? So, so by calling you not to hear the message, he's gotten you to listen to it and to be a part of it. And by being a part of it, he got you to the point where he can cover up and keep your mind from being able to ever really clearly see it unless someone, somehow, some way, God is able to send you light that you can actually hear and break the spell of this bewitch. You ever, some of you maybe have been, as children, before you really knew the message, into Greek mythology. There's an there's a, a, a idea in Greek mythology or a story in Greek mythology about the sirens. Anyone ever remember reading about the sirens? You had these various sailors that would sail across the sea and there was one sp specific island We you had these, these women called the sirens. They had beautiful music and they would go out over the sea and these sailors would hear this beautiful music and because they had been away from life and, and, and festivities and women for so long, they had this beautiful voices of women and so on, and they'd be drawn in and they would try and change their course and come to where these sirens are, and then when they would go there, these women would take them and eat them alive. They thought they were hearing music and festivity and beautiful music, and their heart fell in love with these voices, but it led to their destruction. This is Greek mythology saying this. What about the Bible? It says, God, oh, sorry, pardon me, it said, better never have the worship of God blended with music than to use musical instruments to do the work which last January was represented to me. She says, represented to me would be brought into our camp meetings. Now, brother, have you been to camp meetings, lady? What kind of music do you hear? When would it happen? Just before the close of probation. The truth for this time, three news message, needs nothing of this kind in its work of converting serves. You said, what? Yeah, we need music. Music is important. We, brothers and sisters, better than not have it. If you're going to use that, 
with the three hands. They're, they're, they're incongruent. She said, we don't need this. A bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which, if conducted aright, might be a blessing. The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and noise to have a carnival. What is connected with this? Who comes into these assemblies, she says? Satanic forces. And this is termed the Holy Spirit's working. When the camp meeting is ended, when the meeting or revival, so called, is ended, the good which ought to have been done and which might have been done by the presentation of sacred truth is not accomplished. Those participating in the supported revival receive impressions which lead them to Christ. They do, but don't they profess Christ? Don't some people cry and give their heart to the Lord? Yeah, they, give, they, they cry and say, but it leads them where? Adrift, away from Bible truth. They cannot tell what they formerly knew regarding Bible principles. That's just the, that's the lay people now. Not, not the pastors, right? They can't remember what they formerly knew as Bible truth. No encouragement should be given this kind of worship except if the conference does it. No encouragement should be given this kind of worship except if a big pastor thinks it's okay. Except the NAD makes a policy and says it's okay. See, brothers, it comes down to you want to believe, believe the Word of God or you want to believe the popular trend that's going on the broad way to perdition. No encouragement should be given to this kind of worship. The same kind of influence came in after the passing of time in 1844. The same kind of representations were made. Men became excited and were worked by power, thought to be the power of, thought to be the power of. When this happened, same thing happened in 1844. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. That would happen at the beginning of the world, will be repeated when? Right now. Right now. Brothers and sisters, worship, which should have been a principle by which we are showing the world the true methods, we have gone in the retrograde. We have backslidden and come to a point where we're trying to imitate what the world, even some not doing it better than.